Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Although I may commend you for your inspiring leadership uh, during this uh, Rao Wallenberg commemorative year. You helped make things possible in countries across the world, and including in my own country, Canada, and we are all your beneficiaries. So thank you for your work. Again, Mr. Chairman and members of the Wallenberg family who are here from generation to generation, an inspirational presence for us all. And under the inspiration-inspired leadership of Nina uh, Lagergren. Mr. Speaker, Per Westerberg, whom we welcomed recently in, in Canada, and I have to say, uh, being in a parliamentary chamber, uh, I feel very much at home. I feel at home in Sweden. I feel particularly at home in a, a parliamentary uh, chamber, which is reflective and a reminder of being in our parliamentary chamber in Canada. Ministers, Excellencies, Honoured Guests, Friends, I'm delighted to be here and to participate in the common cause which brings us together, which I take to be the struggle against hate, against racism, against atrocity, against indifference, which Rao Wallenberg showed us as an antidote to indifference, against impunity, against the crime whose name we should even shudder to mention, namely genocide. And this as part of the larger struggle for human rights, for human dignity, for international justice in our time. As my late father would seek to teach me when I was too young to understand the profundity of his lessons at the time, when he would say to me that the pursuit of justice is equal to all the other commandments combined. And then would say to me, as the book from Living History itself says, this is that which you should teach unto your children. And he would invoke the biblical injunction of justice, justice shall you pursue. And say to me that the word tzedek in Hebrew needed three words, at least in English or in French, to translate it. Justice and charity and righteousness and all the things that Rao Wallenberg embodied. But I have to say to you that it was my late mother also, blessed memory, whom when she heard my father teaching me these lessons, would say to me, if you want to pursue justice, you have to understand, you have to feel the injustice about you. You have to go in and about your community and beyond and feel the injustice and combat the injustice. Otherwise, the pursuit of justice is an abstraction. Otherwise, it remains a theoretical concept. You have to go in and amongst the people and combat the injustice. And Raoul Wallenberg is metaphor and message of one who committed himself and then undertook and then acted upon the combating of injustice. And as it happens, we meet today in this chamber at an important historical moment of remembrance and reminder. We meet on the eve next month of the commemoration of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, which itself grew out of the first Stockholm Conference on the Holocaust. And I have to say that I had the privilege of being here for all four of those conferences aptly described as conferences on conscience and humanity. Again, when one hears those terms, as indeed Foreign Minister Carl Bildt mentioned, conscience and humanity, that which was embodied by Rao Wallenberg. And that International Holocaust Remembrance Day serves itself as a reminder of horrors too terrible to be believed, but not too terrible to have happened. And it's also as we meet the eve of the 65th year of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the Magna Carta of humankind. It's almost appropriate that as we end the Rao Wallenberg commemorative year, we enter into the 65th anniversary year of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, reminding us of our protective responsibility with regard to 
the rights embodied in that universal declaration, that Magna Carta of humankind. And it is also, and this was the day before the universal declaration, the 65th anniversary of the Genocide Convention, sometimes referred to as the Never Again Convention, but which has tragically been violated again and again. And of course, the centenary year of Rao Wallenberg, who is a great and good son of Sweden, and I'm proud to say the first honorary citizen of Canada. A person who has emerged universally as a metaphor for courage and responsibility, as Ole said in his opening remarks, and as Foreign Minister Karl Bloch himself reaffirmed. The Swedish non-Jew was credited with saving more Jews in four months in Hungary in 1944 than almost any other single government or organization. The disappeared hero of humanity, the conscience of humanity, whom the United Nations called the greatest humanitarian of the 20th century, who best embodied that Talmudic idiom that if you save a single life, it is as if you have saved an entire universe. It's just as if you kill a single person, it is as if you have killed an entire universe who confronted the Nazi regime, resisted, prevailed, as Foreign Minister Carl Bildt put it, human values in that prevailing and thereby transformed history. Tragically, the person who rescued so many was not rescued himself by so many who could. I've had the privilege of working with the Wallenberg family. I've seen that steadfast commitment from generation to generation to learn what was indeed the fate of Rao Wallenberg. Having the privilege to serve on an international commission on the fate and whereabouts of Rao Wallenberg with Professor Guy von Dardo, learning to admire that steadfast commitment that humility, that modesty, but that unrelenting dedication to its goal. And as we ourselves affirmed in our International Commission's report, and we drew upon the only court judgment that has yet taken place, a 1985 judgment of a federal court in the United States, which said, and I quote, that the evidence was incontrovertible, those are their words, not mine, but incontrovertible, that Rao Wallenberg did not die in 1947, as the Soviets claimed he did. That the evidence was credible, that Rao Wallenberg was alive in the 50s and 60s and could possibly even have been alive after that. And then I think what was the more compelling observation, along with the others, that the burden of proof lay, as I put it then, on the Soviet Union to rebut these allegations, which have not yet been done, and that, as we concluded, that Rao Wallenberg remained, in legal terms, a disappeared person. And I want to commend those now engaged, the researchers, along with the Wallenberg family and the Swedish government, dedicated to determining what, in fact, was Rao Wallenberg's fate. You know, the exhibit of the Swedish Institute, which came recently uh, to Ottawa, and which is highlighted by that statement of Rao Wallenberg, uh, which really reflects and represents that commitment. And he said, for me, there was no other choice. I think for us, in terms of getting at the truth and opening up, to use a former Soviet metaphor, the blank spots of Soviet history, there is for us no other choice as well. And I recall when we visited Vladimir Prison at the end of 
uh, August 1990 in the company of Professor Givan Dardel, who led our research along with uh, the group of researchers who have been working then and continue to work now. And the thing that struck me, and I won't go into any of the findings, or the thing that struck me in my own interviewing of the people there was what we determined and found out was that the Soviet Union had never visited Vladimir prison. None of its officials had come there. They had not interrogated any of the prison officials, any of the medical personnel, any of the inmates, accessed any of the archives, so that in legal terms, one would say, they were legally stopped from claiming at the time that they had done all they could because they had not then even visited the site where a significant number of alleged representations of witness testimony about uh, the whereabouts of Raoul Wallenberg uh, had in fact been conveyed. And so now we move to the theme that has been put before us against this backdrop, and that is in terms that this conference is about the future. It is about the lessons to be learned. As Kierkegaard put it, that while one must act in and towards the future, one can sometimes understand it best by appreciating and learning from the past. And so what I would like to do now, I'm 65 years later, after the Genocide Convention, and in the shadow before that of the Holocaust and its attendant evils gave birth to it, and against that inspirational and the backdrop of the inspirational commitment and action of Rao Wallenberg to share with you a number of historical lessons but in terms of their contemporary application today, in terms of where we go from here, as has been said before me today, in terms of giving expression to that legacy. And I want to pay tribute here to Raoul Wallenberg's grandchildren, because we are going from generation to generation. They are embodying that legacy. They are giving expression to it. They are themselves uh, serving as models for what is now needed. And so the first lesson in that regard, and that is the imperative of remembrance itself, what the French call le devoir de mémoire, the duty of memory. And as we remember six million Jewish victims of the Holocaust, defamed, demonized, and dehumanized as prologue or justification for their murder. And as we remember the millions of non-Jews murdered in the Nazi war, which was a double war, the Nazi war against the Allies was a Nazi war against the Jews. As Elie Wiesel put it in the first Stockholm conference, that the Holocaust was a war against the Jews, in which not all victims were Jews, but all Jews were targeted victims. And we have to understand that the mass murder of millions is not an abstract statistic. As we will say yet again on International Holocaust Remembrance Day, as we say at Holocaust commemorative ceremonies all over the world, unto each person there is a name. Unto each person there is an identity. Each person, as I said, is a universe. And so the abiding imperative which emerges from this first lesson as Rao Wallenberg taught us in the words, for me there is no other choice, that we are each, wherever we are, the guarantors of each other's destiny. That must be the first lesson 
that we take out of this Raoul Wallenberg commemorative year as we move forward. And I'm delighted in that regard that not only after the first Stockholm conference on the Holocaust when I returned to Canada, that our Canadian Parliament by unanimous vote established a National Holocaust Remembrance Day, but that shortly thereafter we established an annual Raoul Wallenberg commemorative day, where each year Canadians and particularly young people are invited to learn about, to reflect upon, and most importantly, to act upon Raoul Wallenberg's humanitarian legacy. And I've been delighted to learn in discussions uh, here with governmental officials and others that this too will now come uh, to pass uh, here in Sweden. The focal point of giving expression to Raoul Wallenberg commemorative day in an international sense. And this brings me now to the second lesson. And that is the danger of state-sanctioned incitement to hatred and genocide, the responsibility to prevent. The enduring lesson of the Holocaust and the genocides that followed in Rwanda and Darfur, for example, is that these genocides occurred not simply because of the industry of death, but because of state-sanctioned cultures of hate. It was this teaching of contempt, this demonizing of the other, this is where it all begins. As the Supreme Court of Canada put it in affirming the constitutionality of our anti-hate legislation, and as they said, the Holocaust did not begin in the gas chambers. It began with words. These, as the court put it, are the catastrophic effects of racism. These, as the court put it, are the chilling facts of history. And in affirming the constitutionality of our anti-hate legislation, they set forth a series of jurisprudential principles, which I will quickly abbreviate. But I think they provide here universal lessons of the dangers of racist hate speech, that it constitutes an assault on the inherent dignity of every human being, that it constitutes an assault on the equal dignity of all human beings, that it constitutes an assault on the right of minorities to protection against group vilifying speech, that it constitutes an assault on our international treaty obligations, which excludes for Sweden as a state party to this international treaties, as Canada, which excludes the ambit of racist hate speech from the ambit of protected speech. But even if we are to say that the answer with regard to racist hate speech is not the regulation or sanctioning of that hate speech in law, even if we were to take an absolutist First Amendment U.S. position that all speech is protected speech, though I have to say that even under the American uh, First Amendment, there are exceptions uh, with respect to all speech being protected as speech. You can't perjure yourself in a trial. You can't engage in false and misleading advertising. I can go on. Similarly, you should not be able to engage in racist hate speech. But even if one wishes to take the position that in a democracy, the answer to racist hate speech is more speech, one thing I think nonetheless remains clear, that in non-democracies, the danger of state-sanctioned incitement to hatred and genocide is that not only which must be, but which indeed is sanctioned under international law, to which we are all obliged, beginning with the Genocide Convention on the prevention, and we sometimes forget, as well as the punishment of genocide. And that prevention speaks to the fact of incitement to hatred, direct and public incitement to hatred, as being a crime in and of itself. One doesn't have to await, indeed, one should not await the actual commission of atrocities. The responsibility to prevent begins with the actual state-sanctioned incitement. And as it happens and as we meet, we are witnessing yet again another state-sanctioned incitement to genocide, whose epicenter is Ahmadinejad's 
Iran. And I use that term to distinguish it from the people and publics of Iran who are otherwise the targets of mass domestic repression. And we should never ignore that mass domestic repression in our understandable concern with the Iran as a nuclear threat, ignore, marginalize, or sanitize that domestic repression. But as our parliament itself concluded, again, all four parties unanimously concluded, and I'm quoting from the report, that Iran has already committed, already committed, the crime of incitement to genocide prohibited under the Genocide Convention. That was the conclusive finding of fact. And then the Parliament went on to say that state parties to the Genocide Convention, like Sweden, like Canada, are obliged, that it's not a policy option, are obliged to undertake the mandated legal remedies to bring Iran and its leadership to account. That could include the simply modest remedy of referring the matter, referring the matter to the UN Security Council for deliberation and accountability. I'm not speaking of the UN Security Council itself referring it to the International Criminal Court for criminal prosecution. That will not happen. The realities of contemporary politics, that will not happen. But surely the matter of referring it to the UN Security Council for deliberation and accountability, that is in our power to make it happen. And yet I regret to say that as we meet, not one state party to the Genocide Convention, not my country, Canada, not the United States, not any countries of the European Union, not Sweden, which I've always looked to as a moral authority in these international matters, not one country has undertaken any of its modest legal responsibilities to hold the Iranian leadership to account. I will just recommend one remedy. Tomorrow, any state party can initiate an interstate complaint against Iran, which is also a state party to the Genocide Convention, and therefore also obliged by its mandates and the responsibility of prevention of such state sanction incitement to hatred and genocide. Any state party can make an interstate complaint before the International Court of Justice. That has not yet been done. And I would invite Sweden, in concert with other <clears throat> countries of the willing, like Canada, to perhaps initiate such an interstate complaint. This is a juridical remedy. I'm not speaking here in terms of military options. I'm talking about a juridical remedy. And it would behoove countries like my own country, Canada, and Sweden, which take so seriously the question of international law, which we see in Canada almost as a centerpiece of our identity, where we see international juridical institutions as part of our DNA, as you do uh, here as well, to simply refer the matter to these international institutions for deliberation and accountability. Which brings me to the third uh, lesson and following uh, from this second one, and that is the dangers of indifference and silence and the consequences of such indifference and therefore the responsibility to act. As I mentioned and simply put, the genocide of European jury and the genocides that thereafter followed occurred not simply because also of cultures of hate, but because of crimes of indifference, because of conspiracies of silence. And the, what made the Rwandan genocide so unspeakable was not only the horror of the genocide itself, when close to one million Rwandans, mostly ethnic Tutsis, were murdered in three months from April to June 1994. That is horror in and of itself. But what makes that horror of that genocide so unspeakable is that it was preventable. Nobody can say that we did not know. We knew, but we did not act. Just as nobody can say with regard to Darfur, we did not know. We knew, but we did not act. Thereby ignoring the lessons of history, betraying the people 
of Rwanda and Darfur, and mocking in effect what Rao Wallenberg showed us before the UN Security Council made of it a normative international principle, the responsibility to protect doctrine. And time does not permit me to go into it, but I have to say that each day as we witness this suffering of the people in Syria, we may forget that this began with a peaceful protest of children in March 2011 who had banners and wrote graffiti on walls, peace, peace, the dignity march, as they called it, for which they themselves, children, were arrested, some tortured in detention. At the end of April 2011, I was discussing it with the foreign minister over lunch, at the end of April 2011, there was a front page story in The Economist which spoke of, and this is close to two, two years ago, the savagery in Syria because, as they put it, 400 had been murdered at that point. Well, we are now talking, some 18 months later, of over 40,000 dead. And I say, wither the responsibility to protect. Where are the Rao Wallenbergs of today when they are so desperately needed to stand up and be counted? And so it is that it is our responsibility today as we move forward to break down these walls of indifference, to shatter these conspiracies of silence, to stand up and be counted as Raoul Wallenberg did and not look around to see whoever else may be standing before we make a decision to do so. Because in the world in which we live, sadly, there may not be enough people prepared to stand up let alone to be counted. And so, as Elie Wiesel said here at the Stockholm conference, indifference always means coming down on the side of the victimizer, never on the side of the victim. And as Professor Yehuda Bauer also said at the time, here in that Stockholm conference, those of you who are here may remember as these words resonated when he said, never Never allow yourselves to be a perpetrator. Never allow there to be victims. And never, never allow yourselves to be a bystander. The international community cannot be bystanders to evil. While Wallenberg proved one thing among many, as I said, is that you can confront evil and you can prevail leading me to the fourth lesson in which I'll move more quickly, and that is the combating of mass atrocity and the culture of impunity, the responsibility to bring those engaged in war crimes and crimes against humanity to justice. If the last century, symbolized by the Holocaust, and not only the Holocaust and the genocides thereafter, was the age of atrocity, it was also regrettably the age of impunity, because few of the perpetrators were brought to justice. And so, that just as there must be no sanctuary for hate, no refuge for racism, so there must not be any base or sanctuary for these hostis, humanist, generous, these enemies of humankind. In this context, I would say that the establishment of the international criminal tribunals for former Yugoslavia, for Rwandans, now the international criminal uh, uh, tribunal uh, <coughs> the International Criminal Court, must see as important developments in international criminal justice and developments which must themselves be appreciated lest a culture of impunity be allowed to fester. Let me give you two examples of which many, of many. As we meet, the name Ahmed Harun will probably not mean much to most of us here, but Ahmed Harun was the former Sudanese Minister of the Interior indicted by the International Criminal Court for his direct role in war crimes and crimes against humanity in Darfur some eight or nine years ago. And yet, while he was committing those crimes, the Sudanese government promoted him to be the minister responsible for hearing complaints about those war crimes from their victims. What more Orwellian 
kind of leadership can you have? And if we go beyond, and I just might add parenthetically, that not only did Ahmed Harun remain free, but he continued to be engaged in the commission of war crimes, appointed the governor of South Kordofan, and assaults continued. But beyond Harun, the impunity also found expression in the case of Sudanese President Omar Bashir and Sudanese Defense Minister General Abdul Rahim Mohammed Hussein, all of whom have been indicted by the International Criminal Court for war crimes and crimes against humanity, in a, in a case of President al-Bashir also for genocide, all of whom have not been surrendered by Sudan as its responsibility to the International Criminal Court, all of whom remain free and do travel within Africa itself, and all of whom are now engaged in the triangular assault today as we meet on South Kordofan, on the Blue Nile province, on the Abyei uh, region, which had its own ethnic uh, cleansing. The culture of impunity is sustained here. And one last example on this lesson, and that is Ahmed Vahidi. Again, the name may not mean anything. He is the Minister of Defense in Iran, he presides over the nuclear weaponization uh, program. But what is not as well known is that Ahmed Vahidi was named by the Argentinian judiciary as one of the principals responsible for the planning and the execution of what the Minister of Justice in Argentina told me when I visited him, the largest terrorist atrocity in Argentina since the Second World War, the terrorist assault on the army of the Jewish Community Center in Argentina, where there's an Interpol arrest warrant for this Ahmed Vahidi, who is now in this culture of impunity, presiding over the nuclear weaponization program uh, in Iran. It was Wallenberg, without an Interpol arrest warrant, without any of the machinery of international law, who by his own name, or in his name, a warning was communicated to General Schmidhuber, who was marching on the remnant of the Jews in the Jewish ghetto in Budapest, 60,000 at the time. Wallenberg had already left uh, Budapest, so he did not, as Ben Yangbert points out in his book, did not himself directly give the warning. The warning was given in his name, and the Nazi generals desisted simply because of the moral resonance of the name of Raoul Wallenberg that these Nazi generals, where they seek to carry out their prospective war crimes and crimes against humanity, they would be held accountable for their crimes. And so they ceased and desisted, and some 60,000 Budapest Jews were saved. Here was a person, Raoul Wallenberg, who would not allow a culture of impunity to ever develop, but who acted and prevented the atrocity from even taking place, which leads me again inexorably and naturally to the fifth lesson, la trahison des clercs, the betrayal by the elites and the responsibility to always speak truth to power. Because Nazism succeeded not only because of the bureaucratization of genocide, as Robert Lifton put it, but because of the trahison des clercs, the complicity of the elites, physicians, church leaders, judges, lawyers, engineers, architects, educators, and the like. As Elie Wiesel put it, cold-blooded murder and culture did not exclude each other. If the Holocaust proved anything, it is that a person can both love poems and kill children. One only has to read the work of Ingo Mueller on Hitler's justice to see the complicity of lawyers, yes, members of my profession, and judges in the evil of the Nazi Holocaust. One only has to read Robert Proctor's book to see doctors as caretakers of the death camps at the time. One only has to read Robert Jan van Pelt's book to see how architects and engineers were engaged in the minute design of the death camps. And so I say as we move into the year and move forward, we need to see to it that the books of Elie Wiesel are taught not only 
in literature and departments of humanities. They're taught also, along with Ingo Mueller's book, in faculties of law. And Robert Proctor's book is taught also in faculties of medicine. And Robert Jan van Pelt's book is taught also in departments of engineering and agriculture. That you shall teach it on to your children, the great book of the living history form, is given to every school child, not only in Sweden, but beyond. And I'm delighted, as I learned yesterday, some 1.5 million have now been the beneficiaries of this book in, in many languages. And this is the kind of rayonnement, this is the kind of educational commitment that we need to sustain. And again, in the legacy of Raoul Wallenberg, who himself embodied the rebuke of the trahison de Claire, the betrayal of the elites, who stood up against these very elites and prevail. Lesson number six, the vulnerability of the powerless and the powerlessness of the vulnerable and the duty to protect. The genocide of European Jewry occurred not only because of the vulnerability of the powerless, but because of the powerlessness of the vulnerable. It's not surprising that the triage of Nazi racial hygiene, the euthanasia laws, the Nuremberg race laws, the sterilization laws targeted, in their words, those whose lives were not worth living. And it's not unrevealing, as Professor Henry Friedlander pointed out in his book on the origins of genocide, that the first group targeted for killing were the Jewish disabled. The whole anchored in a kind of science of death, in the medicalization of ethnic cleansing, in the sanitizing even of the vocabulary of discussion, of destruction. And so it's our responsibility, as citoyens de mon, to give voice to the voiceless as we seek to empower the powerless, be they the disabled, the poor, the refugee, the elderly, the women victims of violence, the vulnerable child, the most vulnerable of the vulnerable. And I have to say, the most important human rights lesson ever taught to me was taught to me by my daughter when she was 15 years of age, today a young lawyer of 33. When she said to me at that time when she was 15, and these words still resonate with me, she said, Daddy, if you want to know about what is happening in the world, about the struggle for human rights at any time, in any place in the world, Ask yourself just one question. Is what is happening good for children? That's the real test of human rights, Daddy. In any society, at any time, is it good for children? And Raoul Wallenberg com himself committed himself in overall rescue with respect to the establishment of orphanages and care for the children, understood the compelability, among all the other lessons that he conveys to us, compelability of the lesson, is it good for children? Lesson seven is that of the responsibility to educate in terms of Holocaust remembrance. I will end this lesson because you know it only too well. Here in Sweden, you act upon it. And here in Sweden, you gave birth to this lesson in Holocaust remembrance through the Stockholm uh, Declaration uh, on the, the Holocaust. And I will just quote from it. The Holocaust fundamentally challenged the foundations of civilization. The unprecedented character of the Holocaust will always hold universal meaning. Its magnitude must be forever seared in our collective memory. Together we must uphold the terrible truths of the Holocaust against those who deny it. And therefore we share a commitment, as they put it, to encourage the study of the Holocaust in all its dimensions, a commitment to commemorate the victims of the Holocaust and to honor those who stood against it, of which, as I say, Raoul Wallenberg was so much metaphor and message. A commitment to throw light on the still obscured shadows on the Holocaust. A commitment to plant the seeds of a better future amidst the soil of a bitter past. That which we need to remember as we mark the end of the year and move into the planting 
to planting the seeds of a better future. A commitment to remember the victims who perished, respect the survivors still with us, and reaffirm humanity's common aspiration for mutual understanding and justice. And two more quick lessons, and very quick. One is the question of, to which reference has been made by the previous speakers, and I just will mention it in one refrain, and that is, if the Holocaust is the paradigm of radical evil, defying comparison and comprehension, and genocide is the crime of crimes, whose name we should even shudder to mention, then anti-Semitism anti is the paradigm of this most ancient, enduring, of radical, of hatreds. And I must say, I hesitate to use that sometimes academic term, paradigm, because it has a kind of sanitizing effect uh, to it. And so all I will say in this point is that recently at the Inter-Parliamentary Conference to Combat Anti-Semitism, which we held in Ottawa two years ago, and following upon the Inter-Parliamentary Conference to Combat Anti-Semitism held in uh, London a year and a half uh, earlier, we adopted both the London Declaration and the Ottawa Protocol. Over 150 parliamentarians from over 150 countries, mostly non-Jews, who resolved to combat racism, hatred, and anti-Semitism in all its forms and configurations, beginning with parliamentarians and government leaders showing the example, standing up and being counted, and acting upon the protocol and the declaration, and I commend them both to you, not only for our appreciation of them, but in fact for acting upon them. The United Kingdom and Canada have now signed uh, the declaration and the protocol. I invite Sweden to consider it and perhaps add it, the eminence of its signature to it. And one last reference. And that has to do with the question of political prisoners. As we meet again, we find the plight and pain of political prisoners staring out at us from every corner of the globe. In my last speech in the Canadian Parliament before we rose last week, in which I invoked uh, Raoul Wallenberg in terms as a message and metaphor of a person whose compassion to care and courage to act held out for us how we should conduct ourselves. I identified some five political prisoners in different parts of the world who require our involvement. I'm referring to a woman like Nasreen Soutada in Iran, a woman who embodies the struggle for human rights in Iran, who is a symbol of the massive assault on human rights in Iran, a woman who led the struggle for women's rights in Iran, part of the million signature campaign for gender equality, amidst the pervasive and persistent assault on women's rights in Iran, a woman who challenged the, per cap the execution of minors where Iran has executed more minors per capita than any other country in the world. She led the campaign against this. A woman who led the campaign against the imprisonment of journalists and bloggers in a country which has imprisoned more journalists and bloggers than any other country in the world. A woman who defended those who were arrested in 2009 in the Green Movement until she too became herself a political prisoner, now languishing in prison, sentenced and trumped up uh, charges to six years in prison, a ban for the practice of law and the like. This person is in need of our collective voice. And what I've said about her and could describe with regard to others across the globe that time does not permit, but people like Eskender Nega in Ethiopia, like Lou Jabo. Two years ago, I was in Norway as a member of his international legal team. I still remember the empty chair where the Nobel Prize took his place because he remained in prison and his wife still remains now with him under house arrest. So let us remember Lou Jabot and what he stood for. 
simply the elementary right of freedom of expression. Eskender Nega in Ethiopia, the elementary right of freedom of expression. Isaac, that you have a political prisoner from Sweden in Eritrea, the elementary right of freedom of expression. A judge, Alfuni, in Venezuela, seeking to exercise her judicial independence, put under house arrest. Sergei Magnitsky, now the target of a posthumous trial, the first ever in Russian history by those who themselves arranged for the greatest corporate tax fraud in Russian history and his detention, torture, and death in detention. These are people and all those whom they represent in all the societies in which they find themselves confined and imprisoned who deserve our support. And you know, when one thinks of Raoul Wallenberg, as we move into the year where we will be commemorating international law, international human rights law in the Universal Declaration, international humanitarian law in the Genocide Convention, it's astonishing how Raoul Wallenberg then, before international law, human rights law, criminal law, or humanitarian law ever really developed in terms of its contemporary application, he was the forerunner of all these. In the use of the Schutz passes and the safe houses, he not only affirmed the principle of diplomatic immunity, but invoked the remedy of diplomatic uh, protection. In organizing soup kitchens and orphanages and, and the like, Raoul Wallenberg was the forerunner of what today we call international humanitarian assistance, something the Syrians desperately need. In saving civilians amidst the war crimes and crimes against humanity. He embodied the best of what today we call international humanitarian law. In saving people from certain deportation and death, he embodied what today we call the responsibility to protect doctrine. In giving and having the warning given to the Nazi generals, he served as the forerunner of the Nuremberg principles and what today we call international a criminal law. And so we today must take this collective pledge that never again, that never again will we be indifferent to racism and hate wherever it raises its ugly head. That never again will we be silent in the face of evil. This is all if we want to pay authentic homage to the internalization and acting upon of Raoul Wallenberg's legacy, that never again will we ignore the plight of the vulnerable amidst us, that never again will we acquiesce in the face of mass atrocity and impunity, that we will speak and we will act against racism, against hate, against anti-Semitism, against mass atrocity, against injustice, against the crime whose name we should shudder to mention, namely genocide and all in the pursuit of that inspirational dream that Raoul Wallenberg embodies for us, and that is the pursuit of justice. And I have resolved, and this uh, trip of mine here in Sweden has made this so evident uh, to me, to seek to work together uh, with you, with the countries of Raoul Wallenberg's honorary citizenship, to establish a Raoul Wallenberg Center of International Justice that would be a kind of unique international consortium of parliamentarians, jurists, scholars, historians, human rights defenders, NGOs, students, united in the pursuit of justice, and all anchored in and inspired by Raoul Wallenberg's memory and the compassion to care and the courage to act. And so may this conference and that which proceeds beyond us today and that which we will engage in in the days and weeks and months and years to come. May this conference not only serve as an act of remembrance to a great hero of humanity as he is also a great son of Sweden, but may it also serve always, always as a remembrance to act as we always remember that at times such as these, 
Ti sexcus sacus, that whoever remains indifferent indicts himself and herself. And I look forward to the panels and those who are engaged, who will tell us their stories and also inspire us as how we can continue to be engaged and through our actions help repair the human condition. If I may just take one minute because something just entered into my consciousness about a great, great instructional lesson, that of the great sage of Maimonides. That if we ever wonder how we can do anything in a world that can sometimes make us cynical or maybe even indifferent and the like, he said, always look at the world as being divided into half evil and half good. Then one good deed by any one of us, it may just be visiting the sick or saying a kind word to somebody or refraining from saying an unkind word uh, to somebody. One good deed by any one of us can transform the scale from evil to good. And so every one of us has a cosmic opportunity to repair the human condition and as Wallenberg did with so many good deeds, transform history. Thank you.